Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we're live for an hour. This is always the case, or almost always the case. Once in a while I have to miss a live program and we have to play a best of, but I I don't do that any more than we absolutely have to. Uh, I like to have live interaction with you and that's why we've been for 27 years on a daily basis, had this hour uh, each day with a live broadcast taking your phone calls, uh, taking your questions about the Bible, and doing what we can to uh, discuss them helpfully. If you have a different viewpoint from the host, and it's not so much you have a question about the Bible, you just see it differently, you're welcome to call about that as well. Uh, The number to call to be on the air is 844-484-5737. That's 844-484. 57, 37. It looks like the line's just filled up, so uh, call back in a few minutes. You may find that a, law, a line has opened up, as of course happens all the time. Okay, so we'll go to the phones right now and talk to Mark from Mission Viejo, California. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the Narrow Path. Hello. Thank you. Hello, Steve. Um, there was a call, perhaps it was on 419, I guess that was Friday, and um, in which you were addressing a question about heaven and hell and um there might have been another call i don't know a couple weeks or i know sometime before that that was also related i could be mixing these up a little bit but and you and you said heaven i believe you said i hope i'm representing this correctly Mm -hmm. you said heaven is not mentioned much and then later you said that the afterlife is icing on the cake. And then there was also another point about motivation for believing Jesus. And I, um, and, and related to the right thing to do, you know, loving God, glorifying him, and whether one should be motivated by eternal life, that sort of thing. And one, one thing I just want to say now before I forget is that I don't think these are so much in opposition. I, I, I have, I I have uh, trouble with uh, discounting eternal life or the motivation to believe Jesus because of the promise of eternal life. And and I, and I think the Bible, it seems to me anyways, it, it makes it clear that the resurrection from the dead is one of the main events and the main, the main, uh, one of the main uh, points uh, of the hope of the go- is he, is the hope of the gospel, the resurrection from the dead. So, um, and, and I think it's mentioned throughout uh, the scriptures. I, th- I think the the promise of eternal life or eternal life or the concept of heaven is uh, stated in just about if if not every epistle and course in the gospels, except for maybe, I don't know, Philemon, I haven't read that uh, lately, so okay. I, I don't really so, recall. Okay, so you're, you're saying that it's uh, it's much more frequent in the Bible than I suggested. Yeah, that's one of the things. And yes. more central. Okay, well, let me talk about that first, and if you have another thing you want to talk about after, it's fine. I should clarify, I agree that the resurrection of the dead is very often talked about in the Bible. This is very different than talking about heaven, because when you're resurrected, you're not going to go to heaven. You're going to go to the new earth. Uh, heaven is where Christians go when they die. Uh, resurrection is what happens when Jesus comes back. So there's this period of time between the time you die and the time Jesus comes back and raises the dead to live in the new earth. Uh, where do you go in between? Well, the Christian goes to be with Jesus. And since Jesus is in heaven, we could say he, we go to be with Jesus in heaven. But the Bible hardly has anything to say about that. I mean, there's a little, a little bit. I mean, Paul talked about how he's eager to go, depart, and be with the Lord, which is far better. Uh, He said, uh, while we're in this body, we're absent from the Lord. We're eager to be uh, absent from the body and present with the Lord. Of course, those those are references to dying and going to heaven. And there's maybe a few others. There's not very many in the Bible, because that's not really a subject the Bible really focuses on. Now, the resurrection is very different. The resurrection is the ultimate eternal life with Christ, which will be when he inherits the earth and we, the meek, shall inherit the earth with him, he said. Uh, so this is, that's different than heaven. Um, and so 
I, when I say heaven isn't mentioned often in the Bible, I think I clarified that not that the word heaven isn't found. Uh, it's found a lot. I mean, Jesus talks about your father in heaven, uh, the angels in heaven. Uh, you know, there's various things about heaven. But heaven is almost never mentioned in the Bible as a place where people go when they die. I'm not saying they don't. I'm just saying it's not, not a major theme. Uh, but, of course, the resurrection is something else. Now, um, I, again, this doesn't change anything about the motivation for serving Christ to me. Because, as you said, you know, the, the resurrection is uh, kind of a big deal in the Bible. It is. It is. But I don't spend time thinking about the resurrection unless I'm thinking about dying. And I, you know, I don't think about dying every day. In fact, I, I seldom think about dying. Now, if I had a deathly illness or if I was about to be murdered by a, a violent criminal or if I heard that North Korea had launched nukes that are going to land in my backyard or nearby uh, in the next few hours, I then I would definitely say eternal life will be definitely on my mind. I mean, and the apostles lived like that. Paul, of course, lived continually threatened. He was he was in, in danger when he was in the city. He's danger in the wilderness, he said. He's danger when he's at sea. He's danger in danger among false brethren. People were always trying to kill him. Uh, he was facing death on a daily basis. And of course, when you're facing death on a daily basis, there's not very much more to think about except what happens after that. Um, I mean, there is more to think about, but I mean, that's, it's, it's reasonable enough that that comes to mind a great deal. Whenever a Christian thinks about death, that Christian should think about, of course, the next life, because there is a next life. However, we in America, we Christians, uh, unless, unless we've gotten a very bad diagnosis from our doctor or something like that, most of us are not thinking about death very often. Uh, and, and for preachers to, to speak to people who don't think of death very often and, and indicate you know, well, it, it, what Jesus is all about is taking you to heaven or, or giving you, you know, eternal life after death, um, almost makes it sound like that's what the gospel's about. That's not what the gospel's about. The gospel's about Jesus. Uh, living eternally with Jesus is definitely a, a great uh, benefit that we that we appreciate, and we're looking forward to that after we die. But uh, I'm I'm not planning to die today. I, I could die today, but I'm not worried about it. I I, I don't worry about death ever. Because, again, I do believe in eternal life. I don't, I don't have any problem with dying and going to be with the Lord. But while, while I'm in good health and no one's threatening my life, I'm not going to be thinking about heaven. I'm going to be thinking about my duty. I'm going to be talking about, thinking about following Jesus. Um, and so uh, it's like, you know, why would, why would I honor my parents? Well, one could say there's a promise that if it'll go well with you and you'll live long in the land if you honor your parents— but what if there was no promise like that? What if there was no benefit at all to me for honoring my parents? What if God hadn't said there would be anything good that would happen to me for doing it? Wouldn't it still be right to honor my parents? Isn't, aren't I still indebted to them? They brought me into the world. They took care of me when I was helpless for decades. Well, at least more than a decade. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I'm forever indebted to them. To honor them is simply the right thing to do. Now, uh, if I didn't have any idea that there's life after this, or even any promises of things going well for me honoring my parents, honoring my parents would still be the right thing to do. In fact, I would have as much reason to do it as if I do have promises asso associated with it, because honoring parents is doing what's right. Following Jesus is also doing what's right, because God has made him author authority over all things, and he's the king. And you can either be in rebellion against the king, which is not a good thing, or you can submit to the king, which is obviously the right thing. So to me, following Jesus, the motivation for it is pretty much uh, analogous to the motivation for honoring my parents. Yeah, there are, some, there are promises that if I do so, there's good things will happen. But I don't need those promises in order to make that the right thing to do. And if I know the right thing to do, why would I choose to do something that's wrong? Now, I, I realize that maybe not everyone can relate with that question. Maybe there's people out there who think, well, if I could get away with it, I'd do wrong all the time. Uh, those are the people I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't think those are my main listeners. They're not the people I'm trying to, I'm trying to address Christians. Christians are people who've had a new heart put in them, and their heart is to please God. Before you're a Christian, you have an old heart, and that's just to please yourself. Of course, someone who doesn't love God is going to be looking for ch chances to please themselves, uh, even if God doesn't like it. Is if they think they can get away with it. That kind of person probably needs to be, 
you know, motivated by hell and heaven and that kind of preaching, except uh, they're not, they're probably not saved. I mean, they don't have evidence of it if they don't love God uh, and they don't love their neighbor and they don't have a new heart and they don't have the spirit of Christ. The Bible in a lot of places indicates that they're probably not converted. But if you're converted, then you want to do what's right in the sight of God. And you want to do it not because you're going to go to heaven or hell based on your decision, but you do it because you have a heart that wants to do what's right. God makes you righteous. God makes you good. God makes you at least want to be good. And so, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't rob uh, liquor stores if I thought I could get away with it for the rest of my life. I wouldn't rob banks if I thought I could. I wouldn't rape women if I thought I could get away with it. Th th those are wrong things to do. And therefore, I wouldn't do them, even if, if I thought there was no consequences for it. Same thing with serving God. I'll serve God whether there's consequences or not. There are, and you're right. When it comes to death, when, when it comes time to die, uh, th those promises of the next life, no doubt, are very sweet. But um, I guess I don't feel like I'm, I'm not obviously on death's door. I could die today, but of course, that's true every day. But when I'm living my life and I'm not in danger, I'm not thinking about, uh, you know, the next life. I'm thinking about God. I'm thinking about Christ. That's that's what I was saying then, and that's what I'm trying to make clear now. Well, okay, yeah, that's helpful, and that now it, uh, it helps me understand your thinking better. And you know, a portion of you know, in some sense, I agree with what you're saying. I like doing the right thing, and I like truth. It's very important to me. Uh, but it, you know, like in Romans four. Uh, there, Paul makes a strong connection between the promise and faith. There's something about the promise of eternal life that's very important important to God, to Jesus, and that's why Jesus and, you know, even all through John, the Gospel of John, and um, uh, 316, where uh, Jesus says, you know, you— you believe in me and you'll have eternal life. If you don't, you know, you won't perish. You'll have eternal life. Uh, you got yeah, I, I'm aware of that. Let me just jump in here because that's going afield and we've, and we've got other callers waiting. But let me just say this. Abraham believed in the Lord. It was counted for righteous, though we don't know that Abraham had any ideas about the afterlife. Uh, God did not make any recorded statements to Abraham about the next life. Uh, Abraham believed in God because he believed God was good and, and honest and, and should be obeyed. Uh, I think Moses was the same way. I don't know that God ever mentioned anything to Moses about the, the next life, and yet he, he suffered a great deal uh, for his faithfulness to God. Um, so, yeah, I mean, once, you know, once the promise of eternal life is in the picture, it's a very, it's a very big promise. It's a very big promise. And I'm not saying we shouldn't appreciate it. I'm saying that should not be what motivates us. We should be motivated by loyalty to God. I mean, let me put it this way. If, if you had, uh, let's just say you had a secretary that was very, trying to seduce you and you found her very attractive and you found it difficult to resist her overtures, uh, if you knew that you could, get, you could cheat on your wife and you could get away with it without any penalties, would you want to do it? I wouldn't because I wouldn't want to cheat on my wife. I mean, just because, I mean, frankly, I've, I've been cheated on before. I don't like it, and I, I, would, I wouldn't want to do that to anybody else. So, uh, and I wouldn't want to do that to God. I'm not going to cheat on God. I'm not going to betray him, even if I thought I could get away with it, because it's, it's an entirely different motivation to say, I will serve God if that's what I have to do to save my hide on the day of judgment. Or I will serve God because what else would I do? I love him. It's the right thing to do. Is there something like better to do than that? I can't imagine. Uh, so, I mean, it, the question of motivation, if we don't serve God just because we love him, then our serving him out of the motivation of trying to earn heaven or avoid hell may not really be very, um, may not be very selfless. I mean, we, it's interesting how God did not reveal to the Old Testament saints uh, about heaven and hell after life. Uh, and yet the ones that we, the ones that were passionate for God and even willing to die for him, uh, they did it because it was, because he was God. Uh, you know, just, they, they weren't thinking about themselves. They were thinking about God. And that's the, that's kind of the, f what happens when your heart is converted. Before you're converted, you're always thinking about yourself. 
And if, if you can get something good for yourself by serving God, well, then you'll obviously take that into consideration, maybe do that. Um, but you are converted when you change your motivation. And say, all my life, every choice I've made has been just to please me. Uh, from now on, I'm going to recognize that pleasing me has no value at all in the, in the grand scheme of things. Pleasing God has all value, and that's what I'm going to live for. And, uh, and that would be regardless whether there was a heaven or a hell. Now, there is, but re- whether there was or not, I, I would still uh, do it out of you know, loyalty to God. I would still be faithful to my wife, even if I thought it would, you know, you'd never be found out. Um, I, I'd still honor my parents, even if there's no promise of blessing in it. It's just, it's just what you do when you're a faithful person. Uh, so anyway, and a just person. And that's what we have to be. That's what God's looking for. God's, God's not looking for people who are calculating the best deal for themselves. He's looking for people who are faithful and just. Hey, brother, I got a lot of people waiting, so I'm going to have to move oh, on. Oh. Okay, I appreciate it, Steve. Maybe another time I'll call back and talk about the motivation issue. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, Gerald from Michigan, welcome. Hi, Steve. Good to talk Hi. to you again. Thank you. Uh, I have a question if you see any correlation between Genesis 48, verse 19, where Jacob blessed Ephraim and said he'd be a multitude of nations. And in Romans 11.25, where it says... Blindness in part has happened to the... Yeah, until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Well, Ephraim became a multitude of nations, it is true, because they were scattered among the nations. They started out with, you know, as belonging to the land of Israel. Uh, ruled over by David's household, and then, then the nation split, and they, they were part of the Northern Confederacy. And then in 721 B.C., the Northern Confederacy was shattered and destroyed uh, by the Assyrians, and, and, uh, and they were, you know, uh, Ephraim, the largest of the tribes of the North, and the other tribes with them, uh, were dispersed throughout the world where, in, where they apparently have intermarried, uh, with Gentiles for thousands of years, and therefore they are now intermixed. They are Gentiles uh, for the most part. Now, I don't know that there, there, there might be a few people who have roots in the tribe of Ephraim that still, you know, ha- never mixed with the Gentiles, but that in general, we don't know of them, and, uh, and this is what happened to them. So they are, I mean, the Gentiles essentially are well, I, I was not. I almost said the Gentiles are Ephraim. I'd put it the other way around. Ephraim and the ten North tribes, I believe, are Gentiles now, uh, because they intermix so much that you could hardly tell the difference. You know, I, I, we did twenty three and Me for to find out what my ancestry was. Actually, I didn't. I didn't care. But my wife did it for both of us, and it turned out I'm mostly Irish and English and so forth. But it said I was less than one percent Jewish, <clears throat> which I didn't know I had any Jewish. But less than one percent isn't much. To, to, to speak about anyway. Uh, but that means that somewhere in my background, someone, uh, of, you know, some Israeli, uh, married somebody who was a Gentile, and, uh, and, and I got, you know, some of my ancestors came about as a real. So I got a very tiny, tiny bit of, um, is, of Jew in me. But it doesn't matter because I'm, I'm still a Gentile, you know. And it wouldn't be surprising if almost all Gentiles at least in, in the regions that the Jews, is, or the Israel dispersed to, have a little bit of that. Because, frankly, the Israelites did intermix. I mean, uh, several years ago, Time Magazine said about a third of American Jews marry Gentiles. That, that's a pretty big percentage in, in modern times, even. I mean, that uh, these are Jews who could marry Jews and perpetrate the Jewish race, but they're marrying Gentiles, which means, you know, they're mixing. And, and this has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. So that probably most people have a little bit in them. So that Ephraim would become many nations really came about largely because uh, they were dispersed among the nations and intermixed with them. And, and therefore, to speak about the Gentiles would include them, that is, include anyone who's a Gentile, even if they have a bit of Jewish blood in them, or Israeli blood, I should say. 
Thank you. All right. You have Thank a good day, Steve. Bye-bye. You too. Thank you. Carrie from Texas, welcome to The Narrow Path. Well, Steve, I took your recommendation and I was listening to your lectures on the Olivet Discourse. Uh huh. And uh, I've got some questions. Uh, okay. First, first of all, you talk about you produce kind of a side by side comparison for yeah. the different Gospels. Yeah. Would I get the same comparison with the harmony of the Gospels? Maybe it wouldn't be it wouldn't line them up the same way, but yeah, a harmony of the gospel should have that material. But you can get mine online if you go to Matthew seven thirteen dot com. It's Matthew seven one three dot com, and uh, click on uh, you know what t- lecture notes and find the notes on the Olivet Discourse, and you'll find them there. Okay, great. Well, I follow your argument pretty good about uh, how you were saying that the disciples were probably not asking Jesus about the end times, the future coming back, uh, because they probably had no inclination of it. Uh, But I didn't follow it very well in the Matthew 24, verse 3 where they do ask what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. I got the end of the age pretty well. You you explained that well. But it it seems like they are asking about a future coming of Christ, to their future anyway. Uh, How would would that differ uh, from uh, maybe having a concept of uh, a future end time coming. Well, the, the expression coming, the coming of the Lord, the coming, God's coming, Yahweh coming, Jesus coming, these expressions are used in the Old and the New Testament to speak about events on earth which are not literally the coming of God, but are a- activities of God manifesting his, usually his judgments. It can also be used when it talks about his blessing. But when he when he uh, when he does something on earth, uh, and it's him doing it, uh, the prophets who wrote in poetry for the most part would often speak about that as God coming. Uh, I I would assume that in my ma- uh, my all of the discourse lectures you would find me comparing uh, Isaiah nineteen one, where Isaiah nineteen one is talking about the Assyrians invading Egypt and conquering it. And it's, the chapter begins by saying, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt. Now, here we have God coming on a cloud, coming to Egypt. And as you read through the chapter, you realize he's describing the Assyrians coming and destroying them. Why is it said that God comes? Because he is seen as the sovereign leader, uh, ruler of the world, who's leading these uh, Assyrians as an act of his judgment against Egypt. And therefore, it is as if he himself is leading the troops uh, from heaven, from on high. Um, But, you know, he's not literally coming, but his agents are, the Assyrian armies are his agents of judgment. And so also, you find this language throughout Old Testament prophets and, and in the New Testament. For example, you find in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus says, uh, you know, to the church of Ephesus, if you don't repent and return to your first love, I will come to you and I'll remove your lampstand from his place. Well, that church has been extinct for hundreds of years. He's not going to come to them at his second coming, but apparently they, they experienced judgment. They, if they didn't uh, repent, apparently, they, because that city's not even there, much less the church. The same is true of several of the churches of Revelation. He said, I'm going to come to you. And, and, and basically... All the churches he said he's going to come to are gone now and have been gone since maybe the 7th century or so, maybe the 13th. And so they've been gone a long time. They won't be there when Jesus comes because they're gone now. But uh, so he's not talking about his second coming. He's using the language many times in the way that it's used throughout the Old Testament by the prophets, that God is coming is a, a way of saying figuratively that God is judging through agents, usually armies. And uh, in the case of Jerusalem's destruction, which Jesus in Matthew 23, excuse me, in 23 and 24, Jesus predicted that Jerusalem's going to be destroyed 
And we know it was by the Romans. He didn't say it'd be by the Romans, but it was. He said it'd be destroyed in that very generation, which it was. And, uh, you know, th that's understandably a judgment from God. And so the disciples could say, well, when is, when is this going to happen? When are you going to come and do this? Now, they might have uh, they might not have had a very clear picture of how this was going to happen, but it doesn't seem likely that they were thinking the way we do about it because we think of Jesus now in heaven. He's going to come back at the end of the world, and he is. That is going to happen. That's also a coming in judgment. But he has come in judgment figuratively in many ways and many times, and they... I don't think they had in their head the idea that he's going to go away. Uh, I don't think they understood that. I think after he had this conversation with them, they later were very surprised when he went away. And then two angels in Acts chapter 111 had to tell him, well, Jesus is going to come back again. And I think that was news to them. So I don't think that was the idea they had in their head when they were asking uh, their question in Matthew 24, 3. Hey, I need to uh, take a break here, but I hope, hope that helps a bit, Carrie. God bless you. You're listening to The Narrow Path radio broadcast. Our website is thenarrowpath.com. We are listener supported. You can donate there or just take free what's there. I'll be back in 30 seconds. The Narrow Path is one feature of the teaching ministry of Steve Gregg. Steve's philosophy of teaching is to educate, not indoctrinate his listeners. He believes that Christians should learn to think for themselves about the Bible and not be dependent on him or any other teacher for their convictions. We hope to teach Christians how to think, not what to think about the Bible. Welcome back to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. We have another half hour ahead of us, commercial free, uh, taking your calls. If you have questions about the Bible or the, or the Christian faith, we'd be very happy to hear from you. The number to call is 844-484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. Thirty-seven. If you'd like to be on the program today, our next caller is uh, Asifa from Dallas, Texas. Welcome to the Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, taking my call, Steve. Uh, I my question is uh, related to your uh, debate on uh, with a Catholic uh, teacher. I think his name was Steve, uh, I mean, Tim, I think. Tim, Tim Staples, yes, Tim, the, yeah, the Catholic yeah. apologist. So, yes, uh -huh. Yeah, the Catholic uh, apologist, yeah. Right. Uh, the reference to the my main uh, uh, question was to John 6. So I have a Eastern uh, Orthodox background, so mm -hmm. I'm very familiar with that uh, argument, uh, John 6. Uh -huh. But uh, is it, uh, am I right to think that uh, John 6 is a very different context from, say, like the Last Supper in the Gospels? Yes. yes where, it's, a, uh, it's a year earlier. It's a year earlier than the Last Supper, actually, yes. And I mean, it, it, it's also a very different context because Jesus was responding to the Jews' uh, questions about what kind of uh, miracles you show us? Because uh, uh, Moses uh, gave us uh, our uh, our manna. fathers uh, mm -hmm. uh, a manna, and then Jesus said, "I am the real bread of life that came from heaven." So yeah. when uh, when he was talking about uh, eat my flesh and uh, drink my blood. He was talking about in that in that context, not in the context of uh, uh, salvation. Uh, I mean, the blood and the wine is used for salvation, but in the context of accepting Him, right? Right, that's correct. So yeah, so that uh, I felt like you didn't make that argument uh, adequately in that context because it's not in the context of at all with the Last Supper, which is a different context. 
Right. Well, I I, so prob- that, I mean, was- I haven't I haven't listened to that debate for a long time. I I debated that man probably fifteen years ago or more, but and I haven't listened to it. But but I'd be surprised if I didn't make a point similar to what you're making. I mean, that is that the Roman Catholics believe that when Jesus said, "Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life." Uh, that that's referring to people who take the Eucharist uh, and that that's talking about what happened at the Last Supper. But Jesus actually is talking about people having eternal life at the time he's speaking. Whoever is drinking his blood, whoever is eating his flesh, has, present tense, eternal life at the time he's speaking. And yet nobody was taking the Last Supper at that time. In fact, the Last Supper wasn't instituted until a year later at Passover again. Uh, just before he died. So that's when he said, this cup is my blood, this you know, bo- bread is my body, uh, which was a figure of speech based on the, the routines, uh, the uh, rituals of the uh, Passover, which used similar language, but was not literal. Uh, but the point is that uh, you know, nobody was taking that bread and that wine in John chapter 6, uh, and yet he indicated there were people there who were eating his flesh and drinking his blood in the sense that he's talking about already, and that they already had eternal life as a result of that. So what does it mean to eat his flesh and drink his blood? It it means, of course, to uh, embrace him, uh, to to take him as as their master and their Lord, which is what he was offering himself to them as. To receive him in that capacity is to receive life-sustaining bread and, and drink, uh, as it were, only in a spiritual sense. You know, uh, in in verse 54, Jesus said, whoever eats, that's present tense, my flesh and drinks, that's also present tense, my blood has, that's also present tense, eternal life. So this was true of some people at the time he was speaking a whole year before the Last Supper. Whoever is eating, whoever is drinking, has eternal life. And he says, and I'll raise him up at the last day. Now, there's a similar verse just earlier in the chapter, verse 40, where he says, this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him, also present tense, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, both of these statements talk about people having eternal life, and he will raise them up at the last day. In one place, he says, whoever sees the Son and believes in him, has eternal life. And I'll raise him with the last day. But in place of seeing the Son and believing in him, verse 54 says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I'll raise him with the last day. So it's obvious what he's saying is eating his flesh and drinking his blood is symbolic for, uh, frankly, believing in him. Now, in case that wasn't clear enough, if you go to verse 63 in the same chapter, John 6, 63 says, Jesus said, it's the spirit who gives life. Okay, so it's not it's not eating bread that gives life. It's not drinking wine that gives life. Although he did say, unless you, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have eternal life. But he says, oh, but it's not the flesh, not eating my flesh. It's the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. So, you know, you're not going to have eternal life by eating bread or eating, even eating his physical flesh. It's the spirit, not the flesh, that gives life. And he says, the words that I speak to you, including the ones that we're trying to understand here, they are spirit and they are life. So I'm not talking about literal blood and literal human flesh consumption here. I'm talking about the spirit. The words I'm speaking about are spirit and they're life. So, you know, anyone who thinks that Jesus is speaking literally about eating his flesh and drinking his blood um, is pushing. I mean, pushing way beyond what Jesus intended to to say or mean. So I'm... I appreciate your call, brother. Uh, Harold from New York, welcome to the Narrow Path. Hello, Harold, are you there? Going, going, gone. Okay, Robert from Sacramento, California, welcome to the Narrow Path. Yes, Steve, this is Robert. I'd like to ask you a question here. Um, if it says in the Bible that, that God has not appointed us to His wrath, then then why, 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 we, why, when you answered my question yesterday about about the rapture, did you say we would probably more than likely still be here? So I, I, I'm now I'm conf- I, that kind of confused me now, to, because well, of, in my understanding, it, 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 we wouldn't have to suffer in the rapture 
and you're, you're saying we're going to be here uh, when that when that happens because the last trumpet is not going to sound until well, first Jesus of all, back yeah. The earth. yeah, first of all, when Paul said God has not appointed us to wrath, I don't think there's a reason in the world to think he has the tribulation in mind. Why would he? I mean, the word the wrath of God is found throughout Scripture and without it necessarily referring to the tribulation. I mean, in John chapter 1, it says everyone who doesn't believe in Christ, the wrath of God abides upon him. That's, that's like the last verse of John chapter 3. Okay, he's not talking about the tribulation. He's talking about wrath, God's anger. Now, one thing we can say is you're, you're talking about 1 Thessalonians, of course, chapter 5, verse uh, 9. God did not appoint us to wrath. But what did he appoint us to? Well, he tells us that. He doesn't say God didn't appoint us to wrath, but to be raptured. No, God didn't appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. So wrath is the opposite of being saved. It's not the opposite of the rapture. Now, I will point this out too. Though Paul never in any of his writings talks about the tribulation, at least if he does, he never uses that expression. He does tell these same people in 1 Thessalonians 3, chapter 4, chapter 3, verse 4, excuse me, uh, he said, for in fact, we told you before when we were with you that you would suffer tribulation just as it happened and you know. So Paul tells the same people in the same letter, I told you you're going to suffer tribulation and you are suffering tribulation. So I was right. But he has not appointed us to wrath. Okay, so obviously tribulation is not the same thing as wrath because we are appointed to tribulation, but we're not appointed to wrath. So if someone says, well, when Paul said we're not appointed to wrath, that means we're going to be raptured before the tribulation. Where's that coming from? There's nothing there uh, to support that. Well, what they're doing is they're trying to import their understanding of Revelation, especially the chapter 16, where there's seven bowls of wrath are poured out, uh, which are said to be the last plagues. And, uh, and then somebody's going to just say, oh, well, that's a reference to something that's going to happen in a future tribulation period, although it doesn't say so in, in Revelation. It, and there's nothing in the Bible that says so either, by the way. But, but they'll say the tribulation is the pouring out of the wrath of God. Well, even if that's true, that's not the only time that God's wrath is seen in the Bible. God's wrath is seen throughout the Old Testament. Jeremiah and Isaiah talk about the wrath of God a great deal in Ezekiel. But they're not talking about the end times. They're talking about the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon or, or the destruction of Samaria by Assyria or something like that. It's not talking about the end times, the word wrath. And, uh, and likewise, in the New Testament, the word wrath, like I said, it does, not, uh, it, it does not necessarily have to have anything to do with a, a particular time of tribulation or wrath. So, I mean, I, I mentioned this all a few minutes ago uh, when I started talking to you. In John three thirty six, it says, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Okay, the wrath of God already is abiding on those who don't have eternal life, according to Jesus. Now, in this same epistle, 1 Thessalonians, we were looking at earlier, in chapter 2, Paul talks about the, the Jewish unbelievers who were persecuting the Jewish Christians. And of these Jewish unbelievers, in 1 Thessalonians 2, 15 and 16, Paul says, They killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. They have persecuted us. They do not please God. They're contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Okay, it's not a future wrath. Wrath has come upon them. These Jews who are persecuting the Jewish church, wrath has come upon them. In Romans 1.18, Paul says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven on those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. He's not saying in the future. So there's no reason in the world for the word wrath uh, to automatically refer to something future or necessarily, uh, certainly not to the tribulation itself. So when Paul says God has not appointed us to wrath, I mean, it's 100% artificial to say he's talking about the tribulation there. Why? He's already, t a, ch a chapter earlier, two chapters earlier, he said they're going to go, they, they're going to go through tribulation, but not wrath. Now, what that means, tribulation means, the, the, word, the Greek word thalipsis means pressure. It's hardship. You're going through hardship. Often it means persecution. But tribulation that we go through is not the same 
as the wrath of God because God's wrath is only on unbelievers. You know, Jesus said in John 16, 33, these things I've spoken unto you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, he said to his disciples. You will have tribulation. Paul said, I told you you will have tribulation, and you have. Jesus and Paul both said Christians go through tribulation. But we don't have the wrath of God. Now, let me put it this way. Even if he was thinking, I don't think he was. There's certainly no exegetical reason to imagine that he was. But even if Paul was thinking of the tribulation when he talked about wrath, God has not appointed us to wrath. And that wrath is going to happen in the tribulation. If that's what Paul was thinking of, that still wouldn't mean we'd be raptured first. It would just mean that even if we're here in the tribulation time, God's wrath won't come upon us. And you actually read about that in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 9, we see the locusts coming. They're tormenting people with the stings of their tails. They're like scorpions, and they torment them for five months. But that's everyone who doesn't have the mark of God on their forehead. In other words, those who are God's people are not stung. Uh, These horrible things don't happen to God's people. But obviously, the assumption is those people who have God's mark are there. They're, they're, in, they're in the human population, but these things aren't happening to them. And that's like in Egypt, when God sent his uh, ten plagues upon Egypt in the book of Exodus. By the way, many of those ten plagues sound like the same ones in the book of Revelation. The locust, the darkness, the you know, water turning to blood, the uh, you know, boils, uh, the bunch. I mean, most of the ten plagues in, from Exodus appear again in Revelation. And, and those plagues came on Egypt while, while Israel was in the nation. It, it, they didn't happen after they escaped. They happened while they were in Egypt as slaves. They escaped after that. And so what happened to Israel when these plagues were poured out on Egypt? Well, it says God made a difference between Israel and the Egyptians, and these plagues came on the Egyptians but not on the Israelites. So even if I would accept, which I, I can't think of any reason to, But if I were to accept the idea that Paul has the tribulation in mind when he says God has not appointed us to wrath, I'd have to say, well, okay, but that tells us nothing about whether we're in the world or not. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. Well, okay, so, but we won't have the wrath of God. It's entirely possible, like the Israelites in Egypt when God poured out the plagues there, that God could have the church in the world during the tribulation. He's pouring out his plagues on the world, but not on us uh, because he hasn't appointed us to wrath. So, again, uh, frankly, this verse, uh, I remember when I was pre-trib, it was one of the big ones that was used a lot. I used it, too, to try to prove the doctrine until I studied it, until I realized it didn't have a word to say about the subject. But uh, it's one of the big ones because there aren't any real real verses that preach a pre-trib rapture or even even hint at it. But uh, this is the best that is usually possible to do, and it's, frankly, not very useful for that doctrine. Thank you, sir. All right, Robert. Good talking to you. Thanks. Uh, Michael from Everett, Washington. Welcome. Yeah, Steve, thank you so much. I had called a few days ago, and um, I appreciate posing my question again because we have a little more time this time. You know, I know a ton of people over the last 30 years who are not Christians, and they will say that, hey, I'm not a Christian, uh, because I'll ask them sometimes because they're friends of mine. But they call out to God, you know, kind of in a general way. And they say, whoever you are, God, please help me. And they, they get a lot. They get guidance. They get peace. Uh, they get power to overcome very difficult issues in their lives. And the reason why I'm confused by this, because one of the things, you know, you know, Jesus is the, is the only way to the Father. And I could ask many of these people, and they'll say, right out, I, I'm not following Jesus. I don't want him. You know, and the other thing was, is... You know, the scriptures say, like Jesus says, if you reject me, you're rejecting the Father. Well, it seems like God is helping a lot of people, even though they are, they are not going through Christ. So- That's right. Let me just jump in here so we don't run out of time, but I, I got your message. Uh, there are lots of blessings that God gives to unbelievers, no question. I mean, frankly, the dominion of the whole uh, ancient world was given to Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, God has given you these kingdoms. God has made you the ruler of these kingdoms. But Nebuchadnezzar was not even a believer. He's a pagan. Same thing with Cyrus. Uh, in Isaiah, writing to Cyrus, the king of Persia, who conquered Babylon, 
Uh, God says, hey, you're going to conquer Babylon. He says, even though you don't know me, even though you don't me, I'm, don't know me, I'm going to do this uh, through you. So yeah, now Jesus said, God is, uh, we should be like God in that he, we shouldn't just love our friends. We should also love our enemies. We should be like our father because he causes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. And he causes his rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. So, in other words, God does good things, even to his enemies. In fact, we were all his enemies when he did the really good thing of sending Jesus to die for us. Uh, we were all his enemies then. So, we know that God is not hostile to his enemies. Uh, he wants them saved. He, he's merciful toward them. Uh, and a lot of people, a lot of people who don't know him aren't exactly his enemies, at least, I mean, they are in a sense, because Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. But they're not really in their own minds, enemies of his. They're more or less apathetic, or they might even kind of like God in a way, but they, you know, they're just not submitted to Christ. I mean, there's a lot of people who aren't enemies per se, just like there's people in my neighborhood who don't know me, and uh, they're not my enemies, and they're not my friends. And, uh, and, and yet, if they were in trouble, I'm a good neighbor. I'd help them. Like, like it says in the law of Moses in Exodus, it says, if you see, if you see the, the donkey of the man uh, who hates you fallen under its load, help it back up. If you see the ox of your enemy who's gotten loose and is out of strength, take it back to him. Now, this is your neighbor who hates you, who's your enemy. And yet, you know, do for him what you'd want done to you. That's what love your neighbor as you love yourself means. You do for them what you would want done to, uh, to you. Why? Because that's what God does. God is that way toward all of us. God is good to all. Uh, God loves all. God wants all to be saved. Now, if we say, well, well, then if people, you know, if God will help people, even if they're not Christians, why be a Christian? Well, that kind of gets back to something we were talking about earlier. Is are we Christians because it's good for us? Well, God's even good to people who aren't Christians sometimes. So maybe we could just not be Christians. Maybe God would be good to us too. Well, if we're just looking out for us, I guess that would make an argument. But being a Christian isn't looking out for yourself. It's being repentant. Repentant means I used to think it was all about me and that everything I did should be for my benefit. But I've changed. That's what repentance means. I've changed my mind. What about? About who it's about. It's not about me. It's about God. My concern should not be about what helps me, what helps promote God's favor, what helps to promote God's happiness. He's the one who owns the universe. Shouldn't he be made happy? How, how do I have a claim on that, on happiness? When I mean, God's the one who has the claim on me. So when I change my mind and I say, well, I, you know, uh, I, it's not about me. It's about God. Therefore, I'm going to, God wants me to follow Jesus. So I'm going to do that. Okay, great. Now, what if I don't do that? Well, maybe he'll still get me out of trouble sometimes. Maybe he'll still do good things for me. Maybe he'll still cause the sun to rise on my garden as well as on my Christian neighbor's garden. Uh, maybe he'll still cause the rain to come on my field as he does on the Christian's field, even if I'm not a Christian. So what? If I'm only car caring about me, I guess that's all, I, that's all I need. That's good enough. But as a Christian, I'm, I'm not supposed to be concerned only about me. I should be concerned mostly about whether I'm doing what God is pleased with, because he, not I, have the right for all things to be pleasing to him. God created the universe. It's his right to find pleasure in it, for it to go the way he wants it to go. I don't have any such rights, so why should I be laboring for my happiness when uh, I don't even deserve anything? Well, you know, but you do find, of course, obviously, when you do serve God, there are blessings that come to you that don't come to everybody. I mean, the fact that a non-Christian in trouble may call out to God and God may mercifully help him, that doesn't mean that there aren't a whole lot of blessings in following Christ that the non-Christian will never know. And it certainly does not mean that God will be happy with that person, even if he does kind things for them. God does good things even for his enemies. So uh, that, uh, when Jesus said about those who are crucifying him, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, that showed some real mercy to them. But that didn't mean they were making him happy. Uh, it's, you know, if, 
if crucifying Jesus, if I can be forgiven for that, then should I do it? Uh, I can't think of a good reason to, unless I'm just thinking about me. But making him happy is more important than making me happy. If I'm if my head is screwed on straight, you know, if I'm if I'm upside down in my thinking, then I of course won't agree with that. But I believe anyone who's who thinks rationally knows that God's being pleased is far more what the universe is for than me being pleased is. Jeff from Dallas, Texas, welcome. Thanks for calling. Hey, Steve. Thanks for taking my call. Um, first time uh-huh. call here. Um, I'm in. I'm in Isaiah 19, um, verses 23 through 25, mm-hmm. and it's it's talking about the highway of holiness, and the Assyrians will go to Egypt, and Egyptians to Assyria. Um, in that day, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. And then the last verse is what I'm, I'm interested in your commentary. Uh, for the Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, it's Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. Um, Egypt and Israel seem um, self-explanatory to me. Why do you think Assyria is described as God's handiwork? Well, uh this is, first of all, the very mention of the highway lets us know that this is one of the many Isaiahic passages that talk about the highway, which is the Christ. Christ is the way. He's the highway. And we know this because Isaiah 40 tells us that the voice of one crying in the wilderness to build that highway is you know, going to be John the Baptist. He's the one who's preparing the way of the Lord. He's going to build a highway in the wilderness. In Isaiah 35, it talks about uh, the messianic time. It says there will be a highway there, the highway of holiness, and you know, uh, a fool can walk on it without strain, and, and there's going to be no lions there and so forth. The righteous will walk on it. If you, uh, Isaiah 11 also mentions this highway. Uh, Isaiah has probably half a dozen passages that mention this highway, and they're all about the new covenant way, following Jesus is the highway of holiness. Now, when Isaiah 19 introduces this at the end and talks about this highway, we realize, oh, okay, we're on that subject again, okay? Now, what is it? It's, it's a highway between uh, Israel and Egypt and Assyria. And, and these, in other words, these, these groups become like a triumvirate. They're, they're, like, uh, they're like one people. It's like they're God's handiwork, as Israel was. They are God's people, as Israel was. Israel and Egypt are. Now, why are Israel and Egypt cho- uh, I'm sorry, Assyria and Egypt, why are they chosen? Because those are the two nations up to that point that had oppressed Israel previously. Egypt was oppressed for 400 years uh, until the Exodus by Egypt. And then they were oppressed by the Assyrians, which actually wiped out the northern kingdom and, and uh, you know attacked and menaced the southern kingdom too, and destroyed many of their cities. So these were the the great Gentile enemies of Israel. Uh, Other names could have been picked out, but these were the the samples that were the best examples of Gentiles who are enemies of Israel. And he's saying, listen, the Gentiles who have been Israel's enemy and Israel will be joined together in one people. And this, I believe, is fulfilled in Ephesians chapter 2 where Paul says that God took the Jew and the Gentile and he broke down the hostility that was between them and made in himself one new man in Christ. So I believe this is one of the several Isaiahic prophecies about the new covenant era in Christ and the merging of the Jews and Gentiles into a a peaceable coalition in Christ as opposed to the hostility they had before. And that's why I think uh, those two nations are chosen because they are particularly the big enemies The the Gentiles were the biggest enemies of Israel, and uh, therefore they made good samples of the point he wanted to make. You've been listening to The Narrow Path. We are listener-supported. Our website is thenarrowpath.com. Thanks for joining us. Let's talk again tomorrow.